Okay, move out. U.S. cities, a training program for Vietnamese civilians, the U.S. Army's candid cameraman, AUSA Convention, Washington, D.C. These stories today on Your Army Reports. To protect our key cities and industrial centers from air attack, the North American Air Defense Command, through its Army component, ARADCOM, controls the ground defenses which must detect, track, and destroy enemy aircraft that might penetrate U.S. airspace. Ringing American cities with high-altitude Nike Hercules missiles, the Army Air Defense Command maintains crews of expertly trained missile men who operate its air defense facilities. In any emergency, the missile batteries receive their instructions from Army command posts, which in turn are fed air defense intelligence from various North American air defense agencies. The equipment of a Nike Hercules battery, which is the bulwark of our metropolitan air defense system, is located in two distinct areas. The battery control area contains tracking and control equipment, which guide a missile to intercept and destroy its target. Anywhere from one to three miles from the battery control section is the launching area, which has facilities and equipment for assembling, checking out, and launching the Nike Hercules missile. Missiles are stored in the launching section until they are required for tactical use. During storage, tests are conducted constantly to make sure that the missiles and their control equipment are operational. Periodic exercises are held to keep the missile crew in readiness condition. The missiles are brought above ground during practice alerts. missile onto a launcher. Pre-firing safety checks are quickly made. When the missiles are ready to fire, crew members clear the area and descend to an underground room. are elevated on their launchers to firing position. The crew notifies the launching control station a short distance away which missiles are ready to be fired. The launching control officer selects the section from which a given missile is to be launched. The information is relayed electronically to the battery control area. The battery control officer has radar consoles, scopes, and other equipment to inform him what is happening in his battery and in the airspace which it is defending. Acquisition radars detect approaching targets and send information to the target tracking radars. These lock on the target. 
The missile tracking radar is locked on a designated missile to guide it in flight. All tracking information is immediately available to the battery control officer. At the proper time, the fire command is sent to the launching area and the Nike Hercules missile is on its way. These films, photographed over test ranges, show the converging paths of missile and target. Computers calculate a kill point where the missile will meet the target. At the moment of intercept, the burst command is sent to the missile by the computer, and the target is destroyed. To the men of the Army Air Defense Command, vigilance is a daily routine, ensuring that no enemy air threat to American cities shall go unchallenged. A central training institute for Vietnamese civilians has been established by the U.S. Army in Vietnam to meet the growing demand for skills which can be used in military support activities. Staffed by 42 Vietnamese teachers, the institute offers instruction in a variety of subjects, including a two-week course in vehicle operation. Basic classroom orientation teaches the fundamentals of driving, then practical experience in automotive maintenance on various types of army vehicles. 90% of the trainees have never driven before. They must qualify on several different vehicles under conditions which they might encounter as army drivers. Careful handling of equipment is essential to the movement of military supplies. One third of the registrants in a forklift operator's course are women. The training is made available by the Institute on a countrywide basis through eight area offices. Teachers are sent to these areas from Saigon to establish the classes. Driver safety is emphasized. Operators make trial runs on obstacle courses to prepare them for passage over Vietnam's many difficult roads. Upon completion of the course, each operator will be given a Vietnamese government driver's license. In the first year of its operation, the Institute has graduated over 4,000 skilled workers. Among these are graduates of a clerk typist course designed to develop office skills. Students are required to type accurately at least 35 words a minute. Most of the graduates will be employed at U.S. government facilities in Vietnam. Courses are given in telephone courtesy, filing, and military correspondence. In addition, English language comprehension and speaking ability is required to perform administrative routines. This audio language laboratory, patterned after those in U.S. schools, is used in English language classes and in training translators and interpreters. The Central Institute's training program will leave a foundation of skills in the country which could help considerably in Vietnam's economic and social development. Activities of the U.S. Army in Vietnam are recorded by combat photographers. This booby trap and demolition class, given by engineers of the 25th Infantry Division, is being covered by a still photographer, who in turn is being photographed by an Army motion picture cameraman. In realistic field exercises, 
individual TNT charges are wired by the class to familiarize them with demolition techniques. The combat photographer goes where the action is. Pictures from the sky show what the land is like below and are used for intelligence evaluation. A good cameraman with a sharp focus can often pinpoint enemy gun emplacements and other valuable combat data. This record of a 25th Infantry Division search mission was filmed by a motion picture cameraman near Ku Chi about 18 miles from Saigon. On this assignment, U.S. troops are accompanied by several Vietnamese national policemen as they hunt for Viet Cong suspects. The troops are photographed as they debark from assault boats on one of the many canals in the region and begin a systematic search of the rice paddies where VC terrorists have been active. It's strictly single file across log bridges as the men of Company C probe deep into the countryside. There are many villages along the way. Near one of them, a group of rice paddy workers are afraid to go back to their jobs because of the presence of the VC. A thorough sweep by U.S. soldiers makes certain that the paddies are secure. The all-clear signal is given, and the workers return. In these unique films by a combat photographer, the men of the 25th are shown flanking the Vietnamese workers with protective cover. It's rough going in the muddy marshlands of the Gia Dinh province. Now a call for the helicopters to pick up elements of the mission force. As they leave the marshlands, the gunships open up on enemy personnel in the wood line surrounding the landing zone. Once airborne, each man reacts in his own way to the tension of the mission. The reactions are vividly captured by the cameraman. The return to the base is covered by another photographer waiting at the landing pad. The pictorial report continues as an Army photographic team joins another unit of the 25th Infantry Division on a search mission through the brush country of the Central Highlands. In this region, U.S. troops are constantly on the lookout for people suspected of belonging to the Viet Cong. Not a very safe place for these two hitchhikers who were right along the cameraman's path. A radio call for assistance comes in from a forward unit pinned down by enemy fire. The armored personnel carriers sweep in, and as the fire of the Viet Cong continues to land within the U.S. unit position, the machine guns and automatic rifles open up on the jungle tree line where the VC snipers are located. of the men from the armored personnel carriers suppresses the enemy sniper fire as it pours into the VC positions.
cameramen with the unit get some startling angles on armored cavalry deployment. These moments of battle, recorded by combat photographers, present a dramatic pictorial account of the United States Army's mission in Vietnam. During the fall of this year, in a Washington, D.C. hotel, AUSA, the Association of the United States Army, holds its 13th annual meeting. Guests include ROTC cadets from many schools, as well as overseas visitors. Displays focus on the striking force and ground and air mobility of the United States Army. The Cheyenne helicopter takes a bow. General Harold K. Johnson shows keen interest in the latest tank. Developed jointly by the U.S. and German armies, the main battle tank 70 proves to be a crowd pleaser and a center of attention. American technological know-how provides the best in equipment and weapons, such as the Chaparral, the new air defense missile presently being developed. Future officers get a close-up look at the flying armored gunship, the Cobra. and its deadly fangs. Additional exhibits inside the meeting hall show the latest in hardware and communication systems developed by our nation's leading defense industries. AUSA enjoys the support and esteem not only of the Army, but of industrial leaders and civilians as well. The association has long worked for maintaining a strong, modern, and tactically mobile United States Army to ensure combat readiness for meeting all possible commitments and contingencies, providing the necessary support of our fighting men. Later, the United States Army band strikes up for the evening's events. Highlight of the meeting is the AUSA presentation of its annual awards. Citation for George Cabot Marshall Medal to Henry Cabot Lodge for selfless and outstanding service to the United States of America. America has been fortunate in our time to have a citizen of such great ability and patriotic dedication to esteemed service to the nation is the highest form of duty. As a measure of the gratitude of our country, our army, and ourselves, the Association of the United States Army is proud to present the George Cablet Marshall Medal to Henry Cabot Lodge. The AUSA meeting is honored by the presence of the Army Chief of Staff, General Harold K. Johnson, who delivers the major address of the day. Thank you very much. Won't you please be seated? Thank you. General Baker, Secretary Starr, Governor Brucker, distinguished guests and the, the people at the head table who make this army go, really, ladies and gentlemen. Now, fundamental to an understanding of the conflict in Vietnam are certain facts that are not recognized fully. 
These facts tend to be overlooked or ignored, at least by the critics of our government's effort in South Vietnam, and I'd like to cite a few. First, the conflict in South Vietnam is a paradox. It is not what we have always thought a war should be like. Armies in the past have normally used military force only, certainly in the early stages. Annihilation and destruction have been inevitably involved in this process. If nations at war gave any thought to reconstruction, they did so only after the war was over. But in South Vietnam, we are helping that country to carry out nation-building processes as we fight. Our war aims are specifically limited, but our post-war aims, which are civilian in nature, are limited only by what we can help South Vietnam achieve as a young republic after the aggressor has been made to lay down his arms. Second, the armed forces of South Vietnam are training and fighting at the same time. Yet, their performances are being judged daily as though they were seasoned troops. Admittedly, they have problems in leadership, but this too is slowly being overcome through experience and training. Another fact, South Vietnam as a whole is very nearly ideal for the type of warfare being waged by the communists. Its geography, combined with the complexities and diversities of its culture and society, and the state of its fragile economy, favor the insurgents. We should remember this. The job of the insurgents, simply to tear down or destroy, is always easier than the fa task facing the building. In other words, it is always easier to be against something than for something. It is easier to destroy than to create. Now, here then are a few questions which seem to be bothering people the most at this particular point in time. And I'm going to endeavor to give my own answers to them. Perhaps the most burning question in people's minds and one that has become the entire basis for some of the most vocal opposition to our government's policies deals with our being in Vietnam in the first place. They ask, are we right in being there? It is too far from our own shores, they say. They contend that we are meddling in a civil war. The answer to this question is contained in the answer to another. Why are we in Vietnam at all? Our president has answered this question many times, and I'd like to quote just one of the answers that he's given. We are in South Vietnam today because we want to allow a little nation self-determination. We want them to be able to go and vote for the kind of leaders they want and select the kind of government they want. We want them to be free of terror and aggression in doing that, as we want it for ourselves. We made a contract. We had an agreement. We entered into a treaty that was confirmed by our Senate 82 to 1, saying that in the face of common danger, we would come and help. We came. We are helping. We are doing our best. The end of his answer. Our freedom and stable government for a diverse group of warring Asians, worth the life of several thousand, or a hundred, or even one American soldier. This thought tears mercilessly at the heart and at the soul of every thinking person. I read the casualty list as they come to me and cross my desk day by day. I write a personal letter to every family that loses a son or a husband or a brother. The replies that I receive, whether they show bitterness 
or courageous acceptance of the sacrifice widen the wound in me that I don't think will ever heal. So I can assure you from the bottom of my heart that I ask myself this question day and night. And if I did not have an answer, I don't think that I'd be able to take the first step each morning that leads from my house to the office. Today, we can point to clear and concrete evidences of progress. And I'd like to cite just a few among a good many. And as I do, please take a look at just how well the South Vietnamese themselves are actually doing. For after all, it is their war. Now here they are. Both the morale and the performance of the South Vietnamese armed forces have improved steadily. Two years ago, the communist forces were on the offensive and were winning significant victories. As a matter of fact, at the rate of one and two a week. Now the communists are on the defense, and South Vietnamese units are gaining increasing success on the battlefield. It has been a year since communist forces have won a significant victory against anybody out there. Now, closely related to the improved performance of the regular armed forces of South Vietnam has been a steady decline in their desertion rate. In his speech, General Johnson also spoke of the valor of the United States soldier. Some of my friends have accused me of being a little emotional at times when I speak to the American fighting man. Maybe I am. And I can tell you that I'm proud to be wearing the same uniform that he does, and I am optimistic enough to believe that tomorrow's dawn, tomorrow's outlook, may be a little brighter and a little more secure because of him. And I want to leave with you this last thought. It's in the form of a prayer that was sent to me by a friend. I got it the day after I came back from Vietnam last time, and here it is. Oh, Lord, lest I go my complacent way, help me to remember that somewhere out there a man died for me today. So long as there be war, I must ask and answer, am I worth dying for?